Mr. Kamen is a true champion of the importance of science, technology, and innovation, and we are honored and deeply thankful to have him here today. And let's all give a big warm welcome to Mr. Dean Kamen. Whenever I'm uh, asked to come and talk to a group of people, I always start with a disclaimer uh, to set your expectations. In this particular room, it's uh, probably a more appropriate and serious disclaimer. I'm not a patent attorney. I understood maybe half of what was being said this morning. Um, it is interesting that academics, attacking academics for being academics, are academic about it. But um, uh, I did learn one thing, though, being an inventor, that these cups have a serious fundamental problem. By the way, the reason they leak out the top, it's called surface tension. Um, the reason things don't stick very well is another problem. Uh, I decided we could invent a way to solve both problems. We put a maybe heat sensitive coating across that gap, eliminating the possibility of surface tension. And we put the name tag and the name on that self adhesive. And uh, we could sell it as a combination device. I have my attorney here. She's going to tell me this is going to be an on sale bar now because I did this. But I figured there may be an on sale bar, but since it's a cup, we could make it a, a sale. It's a on the bar sale, and <laughs> you can make some new law. Um, the reason I think I was invited, although <laughs> Professor Masoff said, don't worry, Dean, just tell stories, uh, is because, at least from my perspective, I've watched this country, and I think uh, as it typically leads the world, the rest of the world will soon follow. I've watched this country in various ways, and I can't say analytically or uh, academically why or how it happens, but we are just devaluing intellectual property. If I played word association with people I know and said the word Girl Scout, they would say, cookies. Whether you have daughters or not, and I don't, I know about the Girl Scouts because cookies are a pretty powerful uh, marketing tool that they have and they're associated, those, those words. I think when I was growing up and in fact until the last 10 years, if I said the word patent, people would think entrepreneur, they would think excitement, they would think invention, they would think innovation, running down the street, eureka. I'd, I think today, especially in this city, if you say the word by word association patent, what you hear is troll. That's chilling to me. It's anti-intellectual. It's anti just about everything about progress and innovation. I think it was a very effectively uh, orchestrated marketing scheme uh, by a lot of very powerful forces. And it's pretty much succeeded because most of the people here that make all the rules about patents don't know much about them. I've talked to a lot of senators and congressmen that seem to have opinions about the subject. I've asked most of them, have you ever gotten a patent? Have you ever tried to license a patent? Have you ever tried to run a business in which you invest all of your money in trying to create something new and most of the time you fail? But when you finally succeed and make a clear path to how to do it, uh, it's the only thing you've got is you know how to do it. And you want to share that with other people at large scale so that they'll do it. And they'll do it better and faster than you would if you had to start from scratch and build a company. But on what basis do you feel comfortable to share that? That's what the patent system used to be about. It was a tool to incentivize inventors. Now it seems to be a weapon, or it's offered as that by a lot of people. So as I said, I, I came here, A, because Adam Masoff always has interesting things and interesting people. Uh, but I guess I am very concerned that while a lot of academic discussion of what patents are or aren't and what they're good for or not is going on, 
The fact is, if it continues to go the way it's been going, I don't think people like me uh, will be able to uh, do in the future what I was lucky enough or able enough to do in the past. Uh, and in that regard, I figured, uh, as Adam asked, I would uh, make a couple of points about how I got to do what I do, because it's all fundamentally uh, related uh, to one thing, at least my understanding of what patents are supposed to do. Um, in that regard, by the way, um, I saw there was somebody up there from the patent office. I, like most Americans, I think, have a general, uh, these days more than ever, uh, perception, knee-jerk reaction to government. They tax you. They regulate you. They spend trillions of your dollars. I mean, government is, I guess, by most at best seen as a necessary evil. Except for the patent office. I love those guys. It, it, it's the only piece of government that has as its mission to create wealth. You know, nobody's ever claimed that these other departments are there to create wealth. They, they collect it, they spend it, they move it around. They regular. But the, the PTO, and again, I'm no lawyer, but ever since this great debate has started, people have been sending me Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution, and it's one sentence long, and it basically says the government of this country is going to give me the rights that's big of them, by the way, because what they're really giving me the rights to is my own ideas. But anyway, at least they recognize that that's a good idea. Um, now even that seems to be something that maybe the government doesn't want me to have the rights to, which is, you wonder what the alternative is. Again, as Adam asked me to do, tell a story of how I started and how I got to do what I'm doing now. Uh, I have to first dispel one more rumor. Everybody talks about everybody Great inventors all start out in a garage. I think it's only a lucky few that actually get all the way up to the garage. I started in the basement of my parents' house on Long Island uh, making a thing for my brother, who at the time was uh, in med school. He was an MD, PhD candidate, bouncing up and back between Yale and Harvard, um, trying to come up with better ways uh, to cure babies with cancer, leukemia in particular, and some of these are neonates, and their entire body is a couple of pounds, and he needed ways to deliver very, very small amounts of very, very critically toxic drugs. And most of the equipment in a hospital is made for big people, and most chemotherapy is designed for adults. Fortunately, cancer is mostly a disease for the older crowd. I guess, as I heard this morning, that means there was a market failure. Uh, there wasn't a big enough market to make systems to help docs take care of neonates with cancer. So he'd come home on the weekends, and he'd whine and complain about this lack of equipment. I'd go down in my father's basement and build him something. Well, if it started out with this concentrated drug in a little vial, why did you put it into a one-liter bag? Just why don't we leave it in a precision syringe and move the syringe very precisely, uh, and then you can put it in that little isolate with the baby, and you can get the job done. So next slide. Um, that actually is not all that impressive looking, I hope, to all of you, but that's well over 40 years old, and I built them in my parents' house. The reason the bottom of it looks like uh, it's a butter dish is uh, my little milling machine could make those front panels, but I couldn't make a deep draw, so I put all the electronics in a butter dish. Um, I made a bunch of these things, and over a couple of years, as my brother went from institution to institution, he'd show them to the docs, the senior people. And at one point, he was at Yale, and one of those adult physicians said, that little thing, uh, if you could make it even a little smaller, since it's already battery operated, these were the early days. This was essentially TTL and barely MO. I mean, there was CMOS, but there weren't a lot of processor around back then. But this doc said, if you can make it a little smaller, an adult could walk around with it in his or her pocket and give themselves chronic low-dose delivery of a drug and maybe a bolus every now and then when they're eating. And he explained, um, you could deliver insulin with this thing. So I'm sitting there listening and thinking, what an opportunity. First of all, brothers are terrible customers because brothers don't pay anything. 
and fortunately, my brother was working on some very, very rare diseases that I hope would never justify the tooling necessary to build a, a large-scale uh, product. But here I am sitting to this world-renowned endocrinologist who's basically saying, there's an opportunity to use your technology on the most ubiquitous need for chronic low-dose continuous drug delivery. There is insulin. You know, there's millions and millions of people, sadly, that need it, and it's a very quickly growing population. Next slide. Next slide. So I quickly ran home and made that. Again, in the early days of everything from membrane switches to LCD displays, that doesn't look very impressive compared to all the cell phones you've heard about. But if anybody here wants to show me your 39-year-old cell phone, I'd like to compare it to this little thing, which was made in 1977. Um, in any event, um, it took me a few more years to build that up and get those out and support clinical research. and I. Finally, uh, a bunch of big companies, some of the pharma companies and some of the uh, device companies uh, came along and I'd be at the shows. By then we were making uh, units for oxytocin and pertocin for labor and delivery and making units again for the broader use in the world of chemotherapy. And we started making PCA patient controlled analgesia pumps and every time I'd go to a, a show there'd be some big company that was sort of copying what we had been making the year before, but we had our new stuff, so we were doing fine. But uh, a lot of these big guys would come by and say they'd like to buy the company. It wasn't a concept I really understood well. We were private. Most of the company were my roommates and friends, and we had moved out of the basement. We'd even moved out of the garage. We had a little building by then. But. Um, Finally, it just seemed to me, and this is the key to why I love patents, and I think after you get through all the academic stuff, there's a reality here you need to understand. One of the big companies said, because all, all of them said, yeah, we'll buy it, don't worry, we can get volume up, we can get production, we, their scale works. Um, but I said, what am I gonna do with all my people? You know, one of these companies said, look, we'll." We'd like to buy this thing. We'd like to bring all your products to scale. Um, and I said, well, but then I'd like to give you my manufacturing group and, and let your whole sales marketing and global distribution group take over. But the guys I've been using, along with myself, to design and develop the next generation stuff, A, probably don't want to work for your big organization. And B, uh, I need them because we're working on a lot of other cool stuff. So here's the deal. You can take the company as it is, but you've got to let me start a new company, which I did, called DECA Research. And without looking like after I sold you something, try to take something back, let's include in the transaction that I will be able to take, let's say, a dozen of what was in a few hundred people that were just the core development group. Let me take them out. And in return, by the way, besides there was a financial transaction in which you bought the products and the product line and the company, for money, that was fair, but separately, if you let me take some of these key people that I've been working with since I was in high school out, I will give you some number of years of what by legal standards would be right of first refusal to look at this stuff before we take it to anybody else if it's in your field of business. And they, frankly, um, and fortunately, happily agreed to that, in fact, said, we think that's a great idea. In fact, we'd want to have those rights. So we did that deal, I started DECA, and uh, again, since I don't think we have to go through the whole history of it, but it started with maybe a dozen people, and over the last 30 some odd years, we're now up to about 500 technical people, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, systems engineers, controls engineers, metallurgists, thermodynamicists, computational fluid dynamics people, plastics, I mean, I got a bunch of really cool people. and. My original theory of why it would be fun to do this was based on the following. I said, we're pretty good at very quickly trying out new things. We're really good at failing. Um, but it doesn't matter that we fail. In big companies, failure is catastrophic and expensive because they deny it, they hide it. It's a problem to them with stockholders. It's a problem to them with investors. It's a problem. 
So they do all sorts of things instead of saying, wow, that didn't work, let's... And, and so at, at DECA, we kind of celebrate failing. I don't have stockholders, I don't have investors. We just have a good time trying to do crazy things. And every once in a while, if one of them works, we said back then, you can fail a lot because you fail cheap. You try, it didn't work, try. Then you get to something that might work and all of a sudden, wow. To bring this thing to scale, I had seen what it took me, six, seven years to make the auto syringe work. I don't have a lot of six, seven year cycles left just to take a one product company, get its product to market, no matter how good it is, and it has to be really, really good if you're a one product company, you don't have a name and a brand, you don't have logistics, you don't have scale, you gotta cover the entire cost of your marketing and your sales and your support on your one product, that's crazy. It'll make it take too long to get these products to the people that need them, if they're medical products. It'll make these products too expensive, despite what royalties are. If you could take a couple of percent royalty from somebody big and hand over to them something, and they could absorb it into a well-run large organization, they've already got sales, marketing, distribution, the incremental marginal cost to them of bringing your product, that is way, way lower than it would be for any new company, even if they pay you a reasonable royalty. So I decided we're gonna work on ever more advanced things where we can afford to fail because we'll have an income stream of royalties to fund our internal failures, but as soon as something gets to where it might look like it's gonna work, we'll take it back to the big guys who are very risk averse about spending 10 or $20,000 on something that might not work. They certainly don't spend a million. My little company does that all the time. But once they know it's low risk, it just takes big dollars, they'll spend $100 million, $200 million to launch a product because it's a billion dollar business. So I thought, what a perfect match. We'll be the front end, we'll take the risk, we'll do the fast failing, we'll come up with every one of those rare things that might actually work, then we'll bring it to them and they'll leverage what they're good at. Here's the rub, everybody. The first time I went to do that, not with the company that was already my partner, but with an outside big company, I realized I'm gonna walk into their office and say, look what I got. And it works, and it's neat. And it's either gonna dramatically lower the cost of the therapy you wanna deliver, or if it doesn't lower the cost, it's gonna dramatically increase the benefit, the quality, the performance. Or I wouldn't bring it to them. I mean, I know that there are these patent trolls out there who spend all night long trying to think of an ever more expensive way to deliver a product that's not as good as the junk that's already out there and somehow make a big business out of it, but that never occurred to me as being a reasonable approach. So I was pretty sure my mental model was I'm gonna walk into that big company and show them something really cool. I'd also walk in with them knowing I have no sales, I have no marketing, I have no distribution, I have. They have brand, they have money, they have, they have everything. All I got was that little piece of paper that I slide across the table called a patent. And by the way, again, while the world has told these people in Washington that, that big companies are, they hate these little companies and they hate these little trolls, I never went to a big company that didn't want to be on my side. I never went to one that didn't want that patent to look like it would really be valuable and it would protect what they knew would be their multi-year investment of hundreds of millions, or in a few cases, billions of dollars, to grow this thing. They want those patents to be good if they're honest, real companies, because they want their partnership with us to lead to their ability to supply a better product and to benefit from the fact that they own it. Anyway, an example of that, next slide was one of the companies, as I said, I sold this thing to, and it was Baxter Healthcare. And by the uh, late 80s, early 90s, we had finished developing a completely pneumatic system that would make a box the size of a uh, DVD player, although nobody knows what they are anymore. But um, it could sit on a bed stand, and a patient could dialyze themselves. Life support, self-administered. We were told we were nuts when we started working on that. But we said we could give people dignity. We could give them access to do this every night instead of every other day by driving to it. We could save the government a major piece of the $100 billion a year that industry is, is costing all of us. And if we could make a box so small and so simple that it has a big green button on it that says go and a big red octagon that says stop and it could be made so intrinsically safe by eliminating all the electromechanical stuff in a normal machine, uh, it would work. We took it to Baxter, they agreed. 
we gave them a license to the patent. I'm happy to tell you that sometime early last year, they shipped the 600 million therapy cassette for these things. It's pretty much a worldwide standard for home care now. And, by the way, I don't have time to show all of this, but a few years ago, we started on an even crazier version of this thing to do home hemodialysis. And I'm happy to say we just got the approval uh, for that product, a CE mark in Europe. But my point is, we have created this model by which I said, I'll keep growing DECA, getting better and better at doing the front end stuff that big companies either don't want to do or don't do very well. That's not their expertise. And we stay focused on it. Trust me, we stay focused on it because the only thing that keeps my lights on, the only thing that's paying the salaries of 500 people, DECA, in 30 years, there's not a product in the world that says DECA on it. My ability to stay in business is working with big companies that value intellectual property, that treat us fairly, and recognize that if we come to something, to them with something that will, as I said, either lower their cost or improve the quality of what products they offer, it's really a win-win-win. It's a win for them. They get a better place in the market than their competitors, even if they pay us a royalty. The marketplace makes sure that works, as you heard this morning. It's a win for us because we get to do focus on what we think is important, advances in technology, particularly related to medical care. And I think it's a win for the public because they get access to this stuff that wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, Anyway, uh, another example, next slide. You saw Stephen Colbert running around on one of these things. Again, a major company, one of the biggest companies in the medical industry, Johnson & Johnson. I had made stents for them, which is a very high margin business. And I think they sort of said, we owe you one when I went to them and said, the disabled community is not being well served by wheelchairs, a 200 year old invention. It doesn't let people, for instance, get on this stage or be seen above this piece of wood. It doesn't allow people to do much of anything. It treats them like a sack of potatoes being pushed around in a, in a wheelbarrow. But a human being values being able to look people in the eye. It values dignity and access and independence and freedom. And I said to J&J, &J, you know what? That population's pretty small. The ability, and this is nearly 20 years ago, Nobody knew what a drone was back then. We didn't have self-driving cars back then. And I said to J&J, &J, the wheelchair industry is a bunch of guys and, you know, with hammers and blow torches for their R&D. They take bicycle wheels and put them on seats, and it hasn't changed. But the sophistication to simulate human balance, make it safe and redundant and reliable, package it up so that you could take a human payload, a disabled human payload, and have it go up and down stairs with an autonomous robot, it was, everybody thought was nuts. I said, I think we can do that. I think the technology is available. But it's going to need somebody big like you guys to help. And over a period of years, between the development and the FDA approval of a class three device, which they funded to the tune of $50 million in clinicals, they got this thing through the FDA with us. It's another long and unnecessary story right now that CMS never gave it a code. It came out during the age of the big congressional investigations of all the fraud at Medicare and Medicaid with the little wheel, the, the scooter store. And I guess they couldn't tell the difference between a device that a para or quadriplegic or a vet that lost both of his legs in Iran uh, is different than somebody that wants to run around in a little red scooter. Anyway, after they built hundreds and hundreds of them and never got reimbursement for it, they, I think sadly and reluctantly, said, we can't maintain this as a business. They're such a classy company, however, they said, Dean, take it back. And after they spent all the time and money, they gave back my license. Here's something amazing if you think patents are not valuable. I was so excited to get that back, and I know the need is so big, and I knew lithium batteries are going to replace my 60 pounds of nickel cab, and I knew that solid state gyros that used to cost me $1,000 are now, like the accelerometers in your phone, 75 cents. I knew that we could build a next generation machine at a much higher performance, at a much lower cost, but I need a distribution partner, and it's probably not going to be a medical company. And as I 
Got that back, I went back to the FDA and asked them to reclassify downward. There's a legal process, you can petition to reclassify. I said, we want to take it from class three critical to class two because we can show you 10 million hours of data on these balancing machines in that fleet. And there's never been a system failure that caused anybody to go down. We built redundant systems. Believe it or not, the FDA granted that petition, put us in class two. I had the license back, and now I'm thinking, what do I do next? When in comes a letter, I didn't reach out to them. In comes a letter a year ago from a little company you might have heard of, Toyota. They're bigger than GM, they're bigger than Ford, they're bigger than, they're the, they're the largest transportation company in the world. And this letter says, dear Mr. Kamen, we've seen the advanced technologies in all your patent portfolio related to wireless control, and is there any chance you'd like to work with us? They were another big company that realized they're real good at volume, they're real good at scale, but maybe they could use. I sent them back a very, uh, I thought, fair letter. Actually, Toyota, I'm not at all interested in licensing any of our patent portfolio to you because I'd rather instead bring you in as a partner and have you help us take the next generation of this iBot and really make it available to the disabled community around the world, which you have the scale and resources and reach and distribution to do. The next thing I know, the most senior guy in their company in North America was sitting in my office saying, we share your vision. Toyota does want to make access and independence and mobility available to everyone. And they agreed to come in and work with us. Next slide. And they made an announcement. Uh, that's a picture of our new one. Next one. Uh, a couple of months ago, they made a major announcement, including quotes by the chairman of the Toyota company that they intend to work with us and bring it back uh, next year. And I think besides making it a highly, highly improved product, we will have a highly, highly advanced distribution system. What has that got to do with anything here? Toyota didn't come to me because they needed manufacturing expertise, marketing or distribution, or they came to us because they believe that we have valuable intellectual property. Every transaction I've ever done has been based on that. And a few years ago, after I was asked to go testify at one of those hearings, either in the Senate or the judiciary or otherwise, and I listened to them all in their major concern about trolls, people that don't even make and sell the products they invent. I had to introduce myself after listening to the four other people on the panel. I was, hi, my name is Dean Kamen. I'm a troll. Um, <laughs> then they went about explaining to me, well, I'm not really a troll. I guess there are good. By the end of the day, it was pretty clear that most of the people that are running around trying to solve the problem haven't really articulated the problem. And as I've heard a long time ago, one of the best lines I ever heard from a good lawyer, there she is, was, Dean, bad facts make bad law. What happens is somebody abuses a system, let's say the patent system, that gets the guys down here determined to fix the problem. But if they focus on an anecdotal example of something that's bad, when the law finally gets written, it gets written with a broad brush, it affects everybody. And there's loads and loads of people. I was so glad to hear the panelists this morning on the other side of this, but there's loads of people that have been nonstop explaining about all the, the tyranny of, of patents, and they never mention <laughs> we all wouldn't be here to tweet about them if there weren't patents. You heard about the massive success of the whole telecommunication industry once it was deregulated, once it was... but. You know, um, am I a troll? By, by some definitions, maybe I am. Uh, finally, at the end of my comments to them, I however did point out, and you heard this morning somebody saying, well, you can't really prove anything. You can only disprove. I, I'm not sure about that, but what I would tell you is I was sitting in front of a bunch of serious people with the power of their pens in the Senate of the United States that could change the rules that I think could undermine all the incentives intended to give the little guy 
when the patent office was set up in the first place, when this country desperately needed growth. And I said to them, you're about to change the only piece of the Constitution I know that creates a positive incentive, not a perverse one, a positive one, to have inventors uh, do what they do. And you're about to undermine this fundamental piece of the Constitution because you're after a troll. And I looked up the definition of a troll because I didn't want to seem uneducated at that hearing. And a troll is an imaginary being. Typically, they live under bridges. But, but I'm thinking, really? Are we going to do this because we're after these trolls? It was unnerving to me. But what was most unnerving was most of the people that are about to make these big decisions are only listening to a few people that continue to give them a few bad examples. And then, by the way, I was told, well, but what if you got a patent on, one of them said, I kid you not, you go, a cure for cancer and you don't want to share it. Now I'm thinking, well, let's see. If I really was that much of a sociopath that I could really invent some fantastic thing, a cure for cancer or maybe a death ray, I don't know. If I, let's say I can invent some really great thing and I did not intend to share it. I don't think the first thing I do is patent it, because the patent office would say to me, in order to give you a patent, you have to make this Faustian deal with the government, the fundamental principle of which is you have to take somebody skilled in the art and give them exactly enough information about your invention so anybody can copy it. Now, if I didn't intend to even make an economic success by licensing it, because I'm obviously a sociopath and a troll, why would I go out and patent it? They would have it for free. So I started realizing it, it would really be hard for me to enter intelligent conversations, at least from the perspective of a guy in the basement, with people that are about to make these big, broad-based intellectual leaps uh, that take the one sentence of the Constitution and make it irrelevant. I would just urge all of you to recognize that I am sure there will be con people that continue to abuse the patent system. They will be. Anything that has value, there's some nefarious opportunity. People have been abusing other government systems that uh, rely on intellectual property. We print money. That's intellectual property. I can't really run my car on a $20 bill. I can't really eat a $20 bill or heat my house. But a $20 bill is a pretty convenient piece of intellectual property that we all accept to make the economy run well. People have been counterfeiting those things. I never heard somebody in the Senate suggest, I know how we can stop those counterfeiters. We'll stop printing money. There'll be no more use of money. We'll shut down the Treasury. There'll be no more counterfeiters. I think most people would assume that uh, that would be a rather extraordinary uh, uh, overcorrection. We have people that go after counterfeiters, and I guess when we catch them, we prosecute them or put them in jail. We ought to go after people that abuse the patent system, but rewriting the patent system so that a few of the big guys don't have to worry about other people having intellectual property is not reasonable. I don't think the patent system was ever intended to protect the big guys that do have the scale, the market, the manufacturing. The, the whole principle of innovation is to bring something new and different. Well, anything that's new and anything that's different starts out small. If it's a success, it might become big. But if you just played game theory, you'd realize that anybody that's now big likes where they are. Let's take a snapshot of the world the way it is, and let's keep it that way. So inherently, your self-interest is, if you're big, you probably don't like innovation. It could change you. It's not surprising that we got to where we are. I know 100 years ago, and Adam can probably give me the detail on whether it's myth or fact, but I've been told that 100 years ago, somebody came in to run the patent office around 1900 and said we could save the government money by closing it, because all the great inventions have already been made. And today, everybody laughs at that. Whether it's true or not, everybody laughs at it. But if you look at what they're trying to do now, you better stop laughing, because they're more or less defanging the thing so much that your patent is hard to get. It has such uncertainty related to it. Once you have it, nobody's going to value it. It takes so long to finally go through the multiple processes that, especially in a fast-moving world of tech, who has four or five years to wait? If anything, I would beg all of you to figure out how to 
strengthen the patent system at a time when the whole world is desperately in need of new and better technologies and convince the American public that the reason it ought to be strengthened is, oh, by the way, if we don't strengthen it, if we let it go, they'll be opening champagne all over the rest of the world where they've been trying to undermine IP forever. And if they can now point to us and say, see, you do the same thing. You can't have it all ways, everybody. We've been a country that's been against compulsory licensing, and now all of a sudden, I mean, Somebody ought to be up there with a voice that says America is about change, and it is about innovation, and it is about rewarding risk, and it is about supporting people that are willing to fail. And in this general context now of the perfect storm of even in government, everybody is more interested in redistribution of what wealth there is than creating any new stuff. Well, then it's easy to pick on patents. But we need smart people that can make some of the great intellectual arguments we heard this morning to have them be put into a context that the people that make the laws, and frankly, the judges, uh, know them and understand them and appreciate them better. Somebody was saying, we should do a, an example. One of the uh, panelists said, in which we uh, randomly uh, take away patents. And everybody laughed. Well, we're doing that now. You go into the courts and you listen to some of the decisions they made. You spent a lot of time and a lot of effort getting this patent, and then some guy, oh. You want to add that level of uncertainty, find a place that's less dangerous to do it. All right, I'll shut up about that. Uh, I have uh, no academic credibility to say more about the patent system, but if it goes away in the end, uh, the reality that we're all going to face is going to be a lot uh, less exciting than it's been for the last 200 and some odd years while this country led the world in innovation. And I would personally say it's in large part because of how this country and its laws and its incentives through the patent system have treated uh, inventors and the ownership of their own ideas. Um, I would like to now grovel and beg on a separate subject. Uh, in whatever time Adam will give me, to show you a quick review of our first program. You might argue, why would I come to a bunch of lawyers and tell you about a program to get kids excited about science and technology? And there's a few reasons. One is some of you are patent attorneys, which I hope means that you're, you love science, technology. Uh, another is if some of you are not patent attorneys but are attorneys, and I, I'm not religious but you may be, and while we can't prove or disprove things as you heard this morning, like the existence of the spaghetti monster or, or heaven or hell. Um, if you're a lawyer and there is a hell, you need an insurance policy. Um, and, and, and first could be that policy. Um, and to prove that, uh, I also have to say, I know there's got to be at least one person here from Greenberg, Trurig, where are you? Um, we, uh, we went to them because they're big and they're in nearly every country in the world and said, we're going to expand first, not just to be available to all kids in the US to give them the tools and the courage to invent. We're going to use FIRST going forward as a tool of international diplomacy so that for the first time in human history, due to technology, like what Qualcomm talked about this morning. By the way, Qualcomm has become, over the years, a bigger and bigger FIRST sponsor to the point that this year they were the presenting sponsor of our championship. Um, but we went to Greenberg and said, every country in the world has to start sending kids to first in the same way every country in the world has been involved in the Olympics. The Olympics was founded in 1894 on the premise that if we could get people from around the world to a competitive environment to compete over something in a positive, sportsmanlike, friendly way, it would lead to international peace. That's in the original 1894 charter of the Olympics. In a hundred and some odd years, they may or may not have succeeded very well, but the millennials on down these days, and the data shows this, aren't all that interested in shot putters, pole vaulters. And the, the involvement in the International Olympics by the coming generations uh, is evaporating. At the same time, FIRST, Little FIRST, our not-for-profit, which had 46,000 schools this year, had teams show up at our championship. 120,000 people showed up into the dome under the arch in St. Louis for our championship last April. And we had teams from 86 countries. And we're not even trying. 
And now we're trying, and we've formed international, what we call it first global, and, uh, and we believe that if we can now offer kids around the world a way to com communicate and cooperate with the same standard rules and the same language, mathematics, and physics and engineering, it's the same in every language. Instead of the next generation learning from their parents and their environment, their own truths, their own rules, their own customs and religion, all of which causes the next generation to reassert the same self-inflicted wounds as the ones before them. What if the first generation of kids growing up around the world at a young age before they're pre-programmed to distrust and hate each other over arbitrary political and other methods of differentiating themselves. What if we can create within FIRST a universal cooperative institution where, where these kids can learn how to all compete on the same team? Because the kids of the world everywhere have a common enemy to compete with. Environmental, food, water, security. Let all the kids develop the same tools, the same language, let them compete on a field where they all win. So the third reason I wanted to explain that to a room full of lawyers is for better or worse, we all know you run everything now. And I could go to the big tech companies, but in order to get them to support the thing, they send it off to their lawyers anyway. So I'm going to shortcut directly to you guys and beg you to take your firms, your clients, yourselves, your kids, your grandkids, and get them involved in first. A few years more has gone by, and my favorite word among all my corporate sponsors is free. They all give us, we have 125,000 scientists and engineers from all the major tech companies in this country that donate their time to mentor these kids to be the superstars, to show up at the schools and do for science and engineering in these schools uh, to support that the way LeBron James supports the gym teacher. Namely, we don't ask the NBA to be in this school and teach. We just want them to inspire, and then the education system will do fine. Well, we need the superstars of tech to be visible to these kids, and we're doing it, and, and it's working. And, and the volunteers are unbelievable. My next favorite word, besides free from companies, is pro bono, and, uh, and that's what we're getting from our friends at Greenberg, but there's got to be more of you that can bring all sorts of support and awareness and, and everything else that we need to change the culture of this country back to one that idolizes values and shows kids role models besides the NBA, the NFL, and Hollywood. They need to see, uh, you know, the Wilbur and Orville and the Edison's of the future. They, the girls in particular need to know this stuff is available, it is fun, it is exciting, and it's more likely to lead to careers uh, than most of the things that are now distractions in our culture. And you have to remember, in America in particular, we get the best of what we celebrate. We've got to start celebrating, again, the right things. Well, now that we started international uh, first, um, and sadly, last week, Shimon Perez died, but he had agreed to become the first chairman of International First because Israel, 15 years ago, had a few teams that were coming to our regionals every year. He called me and said, we've got to set this thing up in Israel so I don't have to put people on planes. And over the last 15 years, little Israel grew to have 651 first teams. And many of their teams were kids that were working side by side with kids from Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, they had some all-girls teams from Palestine that the parents don't talk to each other, but the kids do. And he said, Dean, this is Shimon Perez at the age of 90 saying, I think FIRST has a better chance of creating a platform for international peace than anything I've ever seen. So I took that fact and I went down to New York City a few months ago and said, before our championship of this coming year, we're going to announce Global FIRST officially now, not just an invitational tournament to those 86 countries. And I went to see a great producer. And I said, you know that famous commercial when Steve Jobs got back to Apple and he's back and he did this transformative commercial in which, 
you know, it was shown at the Super Bowl, and to this day, people still remember it as, as big. He says, yeah, I said, I need a thing like that that I can use on the stage July 17th when the Chinese Academy of Engineers, the Royal Society and the US Academy get together in, New in Washington, DC. We're gonna bring them to Constitution Hall and we're gonna announce that through all these international uh, organizations, we're gonna do for science and technology what the Olympics intended to do 120 years ago. And I said, but please, don't give me another, it's the robots, it's the robots. I've got Morgan Freeman. He explains what it is. I need a minute of why we do it. It's so much more what it can mean to the next generation. I need something that people will say, I get it. I got to get involved. He's taking notes as I'm talking. I says, it's not about the robots. No, it's about self -reserve. And he's taking notes. And finally, he finished. He says, Dean, you want everything you've been telling me for two hours and in one minute, and it's not about the robots. I said, yeah. But you're building this robot competition for 25 years. Yeah. I said, but uh, don't worry, I'll get to Morgan Freeman. He says, Dean, don't think I need Morgan Freeman. I need a seven-year-old girl. So I'm going to quickly skip now, just show a couple of these slides in sequence so they'll know I'm not making this up. 1992, we start this thing. I've had four presidents, two Republicans, two Democrats. I've told them each the same thing. Whatever you do, Mr. President, please don't help us. The last thing I need is first being turned into a bureaucratic in-school activity. It'll be as successful as the science fair. I need this to be aspirational after school. I need the community to buy into it. I need superstars. I need it to be fun. But what I told each president for the last 25 years is, you always bring the winners of the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Academy Awards to the White House. Bring our kids there and give real recognition to the people that will create the future. And each of these presidents in every year in the last 25 years has done it. You saw the last president in that video. The, here's the growth of first. We outgrew my high school gym in Manchester and we outgrew Disney. Here we are uh, uh, at the Astrodome probably 18 years ago with our championship. Keep going, keep going. Uh, yep, third president brings the kids to the White House. By then, the robots could weigh over 100 pounds. And yes, they can chase the president around the White House. And no, the Secret Service has no sense of humor. So 30% of the kids on these teams are women and minorities. That's 30% now of well over half a million. Yep, the current president is a big supporter. Next. Uh, we moved the championship to St. Louis. We now have levels of competition from junior first Lego league for five-year-old kids, first Lego league, first tech challenge for middle school and high school, and then the championship first robotics. Next, th that shows you I'm not kidding. Most of you would like companies or clients with this kind of growth. Uh, next, and that's schools, not individual kids. Next. This is a third party data collection by Brandeis University funded by the Ford Foundation. This is the data they collected in longitudinal studies of peer equivalent schools around the country, whether it was yuppie schools in the suburbs or inner city schools in Detroit. That's the data they presented to our board. Next. That's a little more of their data. And that's not a 4% change and a 2% change, which is a big deal in education. That's 400%. That's four times, and that's double. And that's what this country needs if we're going to be competitive in a world where innovation matters. And we've got 4% of the population, and more than half of it isn't even trying out for the team. Next. Yep. Uh, the university systems of the country last year gave us actually $34 million in scholarships. If you walked into the championship and you walked down scholarship row, there were 182 universities, you know, little ones like MIT, Stanford, Caltech, Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech. And it gives you renewed confidence in America. We now have major universities giving scholarships to scholars. Weird concept, anything could happen. Next. Uh, go on, we're, we're running out of time. I did go to China with the National Academy. I went into a school. The Chinese Academy said to me, Dean, you should know over the last 10 years, we've built up 4,600 first teams. We know our kids are better prepared in math and science than you. They go to school all year, they get the... But what we're missing in China is creativity. We give them all the answers in the back of the book. We have decided your first program is so valuable, we've put it in 4,600 schools. Our goal is to put it in every school in China. That is both chilling 
and exciting. I walked into one of their schools in Beijing, and there's this picture of, of the president of China with some Chinese written next to it. And I said, what does that say? Because it's, it's over our first field, which is a permanent fixture in this school. And as you can read, he's saying robots will become, or robotics will become an entry point uh, to the growth of the third industrial revolution. Then I come back to America and hear people saying that robotics is, is problematic to jobs. I, I guess bulldozers are also, once we had bulldozers, there'd be no more jobs for ditch diggers, but it didn't work that way. It's never worked that way. Next, well, there's Perez in Israel. Next, this is an expert, excerpts of a letter he sent me in which this 90 some odd year old statesman is asserting that first, could be the blessing that helps heal the wounds of the world. Thank you.